Hello everyone. I'm not sure if it's okay if I stand here because I already noticed with you that the ceiling is quite <laughs> low and I somehow feel more comfortable here. Um, I just had a very interesting little bit of a conflict with myself like uh, uh, coming here all the way from Amsterdam I, you, you should say I have ample time to prepare myself both mentally and physically to be here and I feel really happy that I can here and have a story like I have ten, 20 minutes to talk to a group of people who are like all I think super smart and you're not allowed to interrupt me like what a luxury is this um, and I and then I looked at my watch my smart watch and I said wow my heart rate is really really high and it's indicating that I'm under a lot of stress but I feel good so I think this is like the first thing that comes to mind when I think about ethics who is right am I feeling well and should I trust that or should I trust my watch that is actually saying like your, your heart rate is through the roof and you should really start to do some Zen meditation right now. That would be a much better idea than start talking to a group of people. This morning I had another revelation and it's, it's really nice when you do this kind of talk suddenly you see gold everywhere like nice examples of what you're going to talk about. It was, it was nice and it was horrific at the same time. I don't know what everybody's profession here is, what everybody's job is. But being a civil servant, one of the toughest things that can happen to you is that one day your kid comes to you and asks, so dad, what is it that you do? Like, yeah, um, I wish I had become like a firefighter or a teacher, you know, somebody with a normal job and I can just say like, I go out every day and I rescue people or something. No, daddy is doing something with computers and, and thinking about if that's good or not to use them. And he said, okay, my son already is he's like six years old. He said, I lost you. Can you make it concrete? And then I was like, okay, um, imagine, imagine you have a drone, a drone in the city and the drone is flying through the city and delivering pizza to people's doors. And I saw his eyes go like, whoa, <laughs> this is like a great idea. I said, yeah, yeah, but then it's not just that. Just imagine that we have this drone flying through the city. It has to know where everybody is so it doesn't bump into you. It has to know all the streets. It has to know your address. It has to, at one point it knows what kind of pizza you like. And my son was like, yeah, 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 go on, go on. This sounds great. I said, but then imagine that you have like hundreds of drones, you know, flying all over and it will be like an enormous mess and, and sound and everything. And my son was like, where can I sign? You know, this sounds amazing. I want this. And I was thinking, okay, I'm not doing a really good job at explaining what the problems with this technology might be. I'm just making somebody a big fan. And then I came to my work and there was a colleague of mine sitting at a desk with a drone. And he was, uh, he was preparing it for a test flight. And I said, what, what are you doing with that drone? Why, why are you going to test it here? I said, it's amazing. I can fly so high. I can have like 4K images from this distance. I, we can do all kinds of amazing things with it. I said, yeah, but why? What are we going to do with it? I said, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Do you maybe have any problems that we can solve with this drone? I said, okay, so I have my kid at home who... I am not able to explain what the problems of technology are, but I also have my colleagues who are like finding technological solutions and then asking me to find the problems that go along with them. Um, this has been basically the, I would say, the, the bottom tune of my work the last 10 years. I'm a technological enthusiast. I have my own 3D printer at home. I run several servers for my own communities. And at the same time, I'm horrified by what technology can and is doing to our society. The other day I saw a kid sitting in the back of a bike with her mother and she was swiping the smartphone of her mother or maybe her own, I don't know, while being transferred to school. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is really bad. You know, if kids on the back of a bike on the way to school are looking at a smartphone instead of trees, surroundings. So somehow I have to bring these two together and I've been trying to do that the last 10 years and I've been trying to do that now for a little bit over three years in the city of Amsterdam. How can we reconciliate the ethical and uh, the practical part of technology? Can I maybe have a glass of water in the meantime? I don't know if that's... That's, that's my watch did have some point and um, when you get a little bit nervous you need some water at one point. Um, so what I'm going to tell you now, I'm just going to get my notes so I don't lose my way. What I will tell you now is basically the story that I'm telling my colleagues. 
Uh, I give workshops and introductions to ethics and technology at the city of Amsterdam, and I explain them like the way that we look, thank you very much, at technology at the city and how they can use um, these ideas in their everyday work. The biggest thing is what I learned from this colleague and, and my son is that any discussion about technology and ethics will have to start from the values. If we start looking at what you're going to use it for and how amazing it is that you can use a drone to deliver pizza, I find myself often put in a corner where I don't want to be. You're trying to negotiate like little intricacies of the, of the technology and maybe amend them a little bit and make them slightly better so they're less harmful. And you forget that you maybe, as you, uh, Rob just put it at our lunch discussion, to ask this uh, question zero. Do we even need this technology? What is our vision for the city? How do our, we want our people to live here? Often we, we are put in a position uh, when it comes to technology and ethics that this question is somehow already out of the door and we're no longer allowed to ask it. But I think as what we've seen in the last 10 years is that this has become the fundamental question. Like, um, I think you had your, your share experiences here with smart city projects, just like we did in the Netherlands, where we try to improve cities and, and, and solve social problems with technology. And then basically the technology that was being delivered that was available on the market was determining the solutions that we could work on. Only the things that we were able to measure things that were data was available or that an app was developed for was something that we could solve. Again, the solutions became uh, leading instead of the problems. In this thinking, we've become, well, not so much anymore today, but I think the problem in the last 10 years was that we became very dependent on both on one side Chinese hardware and US software. Uh, the Silicon Valley startup mentality that you can solve any kind of problem with an app was something that everybody kind of took in when iPhones came over and Facebook came over and Google. It was like, these are the tech giants that we need to solve our problems. Um, as we have seen, and probably most of you are aware of, like this, this thinking has deteriorated. You know, the Europe has really become a, a, cut in a stronghold. You know, we were able to get the foot between the door and, and formulate their own values with the GDPR, for example, and now with a whole uh, a lot of new laws that are coming to really say, no, we want to have a citizen-led, a citizen-centric view on technology and not being led by either uh, the technology that China is delivering or the US. Because at its core, we can see that the value systems that underpin the development of those technologies is fundamentally different. There is a problem with, although it's very, um, how do you say, ethically loaded, the way the Chinese look at technology, Clearly, the technology is supportive of a very centralized state body, very big surveillance state, that we don't want. And at the same time, the, the American technologies that support so much the open and free market uh, philosophy is something that we also feel in Europe like this is something that we can't go all the way uh, along with. I think uh, these days a lot of uh, problems with uh, either the, the, the cryptos, you know, the big banks, uh, crypto banks that are busting or uh, Elon Musk taking off of Twitter makes it all again painfully clear how if we depend on these kind of technologies to run our bigger institutions, but they depend on free markets that, yeah, we get into trouble. So um, the tech is not neutral thing already famously uh, phrased by, um, now I forgot the name, the, uh, Donna Haraway in her Cyborg Manifesto in 1968. Uh, she said, technology is not neutral. We are inside what we make. And what we make is inside of us. The world is full of connections and it matters which ones get made and which ones get unmade. This fundamental feeling is something that I every day in the city of Amsterdam try to kind of preach almost to my fellow co-workers and say, if you as a civil servant are making something, a solution for the city, what is inside your solution is you. You with all your preconceptions about how the world works, all your ideas, your upbringing, your culture, 
you are having categories in your mind of what is important, what is not important, what we should measure, what we can leave out. And if you are unaware of these, you're going to make unaware implicit decisions that might be harmful. And especially in a city context where people really can't evade your decisions and go to another city just that easy. This is a problem. So the assumptions that we, um, that we have to build a technology need to be explicit. A lot of work is being done, especially in the innovation department. We are a department of 400 people, digitization, innovation. A lot of work is being done in what we call Socratic design to help uh, the people working on innovation. We always say, like, if you want to innovate the world, you first have to innovate yourself. So you have to be aware of what are your personal assumptions. What is the assumptions that you bring with you when you go out in the world? Um, very nice if you want to practice this for yourself. We often use uh, an, uh, a little test with people. Just, just imagine saying hello to somebody on the street. Good morning. What are all the assumptions already in that little action? You know, that, that, that it is a good morning, that the person can hear you, that this is something that you should do. Probably that you expect something back. The list goes on and on and on of all the assumptions that are already in there. Now imagine you're building some kind of fraud detection system for the city of Amsterdam. The list of assumptions will be quite long. If you're not aware of these, you're going to run into problems. So the, the philosophical part of that is something that we really try to make uh, a part of the education and the way that we do things in Amsterdam. Um, and then that's more the method or like the, the way of thinking and uh, understanding that the world is made out of assumptions and that if you see them, you can also change them. But then there's the other question. Now what? What are we going to do? What is leading in how we are going to make decisions about the city? And then we said like we ha it has to start with values. Like we can't, like I said earlier, you can't have the technology deciding for us. We have to think first, what is this city going to look like? What do we think is important? And uh, in 2017, we invited 60 uh, different parties from uh, around the city, uh, citizens, um, universities, and other interest groups to come up with like, what, what could be like fundamental values for a digital city. So it's not the core fundamental values, I would say, for the whole city, for everything, all the time. But it's the six uh, values that uh, we formulated that became known as the Tada Manifesto, uh, are the six values that we see that are um, in danger of being damaged over and over again when it comes to data projects, technology projects. And you can think of these things like inclusion, uh, infamously always an example when it comes to image rec uh, facial recognition, you know, that certain people are less recognized by facial recognition, inclusion, or like the, the Tuslag affair, I don't know if somebody of you know this, but in the Netherlands it was a big problem with uh, racial profiling uh, done by the Dutch government. Um, other values that are in there are always being open and transparent, being a legitimate, um, allowing citizens to have a certain amount of control over what is happening. Um, and these values that are the Tada Manifesto uh, became part of the way Amsterdam always wants to look at digital projects. So they are not a manifesto that's just out there. In the coalition agreement, uh, both in 2018 when a new coalition was formed, but again in this year, 2022, when a new coalition was formed, they said the Tada Manifesto is always going to be like a hallmark or like a key document that we have to look at if we're going to do some kind of digitization process. Of course, you kind of then run into a problem because then there's people on the floor looking at you, okay, that's very nice. Six very lofty principles or moral values. And I have to do my work. Like, how do I translate this into that? And I think that is also a little bit the theme of today. Um, we basically said to, for this to happen successfully, you need four things. Clearly, and this is something that most people will be aware of, is that there needs to be a certain amount of awareness. Already thinking that technology is not neutral is quite a big step still for a lot of people. Uh, mostly so in, in sectors of government which are somewhat new. Uh, you know, if you've been building roads 
or uh, doing other kinds of construction work or um, mostly being de dealing with people uh, on, a, on a care level, technology is something that's not at the center of your work and it's something that is coming encroaching into your work and not something people think about. So convincing these people that the kind of technology they're going to use to aid their work is uh, value uh, loaded is quite of a big thing. Then we found that throughout the organization, when in the city of Amsterdam there's 13,000 people working, there is actually quite a lot of critical uh, mass of people who are already thinking about these subjects, but they are often isolated in their teams and they don't feel connected. So the sheer body of knowledge, we found it was very practical to just find these people in uh, and form like maybe a little bit like this, what we're doing today, learning networks, so people could share their experience was, was a very nice thing to do. The, fourth thing, uh, the third thing was that a lot of people felt they don't have time from their superiors to think ethically. You know, there's a project that needs to be done, there's a deadline, the budget is tight, the deadline is also way earlier than anybody wants. So when are we even going to have like a decent conversation like how this is going to help the average citizen? Also, this was something that we really needed to, well, and we still are actually convincing management level people like if you're going to start a project, how can you allocate time for the people in the project doing the project so they can properly have the time to think about it? I don't know, probably a lot of you people have been already doing uh, stuff with ethics. Sometimes the best things come to mind when you just, I don't know, have a walk through a forest or are showering. This can't be forced in, uh, in like a two hour dense workshop. And the fourth thing is that we find that a lot of the ethical dilemmas that people face can, can be sometimes kind of summarized that they're no longer dilemmas. You know, some, some technologies, people come to the conclusion they're so harmful, we can just write them down in rules that we're not going to use them. Like San Francisco did with facial recognition, so like some technologies, or like Amsterdam basically said to, to blockchain or distributed ledger technologies, so there's no real application for this technology. It doesn't going to help any citizen that we use this. So let's just stop the debate. We've talked enough about it. Maybe let's revisit in five years. Might the technology have evolved? So what I've been doing mostly is working on the two middle ones, connecting people and um, uh, making sure there's time in teams. And we developed something that we call the ethical leaflet. And that's, if time permits, I don't know how much time I, if I'm going. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm just going to keep on talking until somebody drags me off the stage. Um, the ethical leaflet is uh, the idea that in, in its basic form, whenever you buy a piece of medicine in the, in the pharmacy, you have something that will cure you of a certain pain, but there's always going to be a little paper that says, but be aware, side effects. Don't drive, uh, don't do other, I don't know. There's always in there, don't, don't, don't operate big machinery. And like, ah, again, not. Like, I so much want to do that. Um, but we think of the ethical leaflet a little bit in the same way. You do something for a city government because there's always a moral reason. There's some kind of social, civic pain disease, you could say, that you want to solve. That's why you're doing your work. But you have to be aware of the side effects, which are also always going to be there. I always like the, the somewhat um, nice uh, quote by Simone de Beauvoir. It says, Sans échec, pas de morale. The, the idea is that you, if you're going to be a moral uh, acting agent, you're going to make mistakes. That's, that's kind of part of the, the problem. Otherwise, if your moral dilemmas are straightforward and don't have any kind of problem in them, they're not, they're not moral dilemmas. Then you can just have them, a computer solve them. Or something like that. Three more, minutes. Three more minutes. So the ethical leaflet is basically helping people to translate, saying, okay, we're going to do project X for a big moral reason. We're gonna, this is somehow going to aid the, the average citizen of Amsterdam in such and such way. But we're going to be aware that the technologies that we're going to use have certain side effects. There might be problems of inclusion. There might be problems that we're going to use in AI that, that nobody really understands. So the transparency value is going to be seriously in danger. Um, and if we list all the problems and the side effects, we can also start to list the, uh, problem, the probable um, uh, mitigation strategies. Like what can we do to overcome the worst of them? And this basically comes from the idea that if you have like a moral dilemma and you come to a solution, you can basically kind of say like, I stand here right now and with this information that I have, I can either do A or B. But if I choose any of them, I have to be explicit 
about the harm that I'm doing to the other side. So you basically say, I'm going to do A, although I know I'm hurting the rights or interests of group that is uh, representing uh, decision B. In this way, make it really practical for people to translate the abstract values of Tada in their everyday work. Because we come at one point at a level that people can just have concrete actions formulated that they could put on their Scrum board or Kanban board or whatever way they have to, uh, to divide their task and, and their workload. Um, and it really helps we find that people really are able throughout like a year or, or a half a year to say every quarter, say, let's do a review on our ethics progress. We said we're, we're harming inclusivity with our project in a big way. We formulated some actions to mitigate. Did we do those actions? How did it pan out? Did it really help? Are we now promoting inclusivity better or are we still in need of some further actions? That is the ethical leaflet. It also, so it's mostly informing the teams right now. We're looking at open sourcing it, publishing it on research.amsterdam. And we're also really looking forward to publish it as a real leaflet for the citizen. Because that's still the big question also for us. And that's maybe how I also want to close my, my speech is with what are still our problems. We have some solutions, but we have bigger problems, I guess. As always, more research and funding is always needed. Um, but uh, we, we really would like that the citizen is at one point able to understand all the uh, moral debate that has gone into a project, all the decisions that are being made and how we think they promote or damage certain values, and that the citizen is able by reading the leaflet, uh, getting informed themselves and also forming a decision. And maybe hopefully also at one point asking the zero question, say like, should you even be doing this? Your, your, your side effects are much worse than what you're trying to solve. Because then, and I come then to the, the final problem, is that I think, uh, and I hope to hear also from others, I think we face two serious problems with our work. And that is one, is that everybody always is doing a lot of ethical decision making. Every human being is like, a, that's kind of what makes you human. You're a moral thing. But nobody wants to think about ethics because ethics is difficult. And on the other hand, the biggest problem is everybody loves technology, everybody uses technology, but nobody wants to think about technology because it's difficult. So we want to leave the ethics to the, to the philosophers in the ethical department, we want to leave technology to the, to the nerds uh, behind their terminals, and we don't want to think about it. And this is something that we feel also in Amsterdam, there's, there's almost no political debate. Uh, when it comes to the council or when it comes to general elections, there's almost no political debate about the technical implications uh, of decisions that can be made. Um, and there's also very difficult inside of the government to convince people that they are moral agents. You know, people are very often saying, like, can't we just have like an external committee that I can just go to with my projects and they're just going to put a rubber stamp on it and say, this is fine, you can continue. Now, it's really part of our philosophy to say, no, every civil servant themselves are moral agents and they should be able and they should feel strong and convinced about themselves that they are the ones with the knowledge, the technical knowledge, the professional knowledge, and they are at the point where their moral decisions need to be made. So these are the two big questions that I can leave you with that we didn't solve yet, but maybe uh, can have open uh, floor and debate and questions about that. Thank you very much.